Welcome to All In Together's Black Women Lead Equity Forum. I'm Lauren Leader, CEO of All In Together. For those of you who don't know us, All In Together is a nonpartisan, nonprofit women's civic education organization. Since our founding in 2014, we've trained tens of thousands of women across America to be civic activists and community leaders. We believe the voices and experiences of women are critical to shaping our nation, and we won't stop until women have agency, representation, and impact equal to their numbers. We convene today's landmark forum with a group of extraordinary partners to honor and recognize the incredible leadership of Black women in America at this critical time. Black women have been the backbone of our democracy for generations, and yet their contributions and perspectives remain undervalued. Tonight, we shine a light on a group of Black women who are using their voices literally and figuratively for change. We are so pleased that OWN, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, Higher Heights Leadership Fund, and the LBJ Foundation have joined us in presenting this program. Thank you also to our amazing sponsors, PNG, Raytheon, State Street, and Twitter, for making this program possible. We're especially proud that PNG, State Street, and Twitter are also part of the All In Together board. One note about our program, the full bios and social handles for our speakers are posted on the All In Together website. And you can also connect with us during and after the program on Twitter using the hashtags Black Women Lead and All In Together. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our host for tonight's program, Donna Brazil. It's hard to think of anyone who's played a greater role in shaping American politics over the last 30 years than Donna. She was chair of the Democratic National Committee and chaired the DNC's Voting Rights Initiative. She was the first African-American woman to manage a presidential campaign, heading Al Gore's campaign in 2000. And she's traveled the country lecturing on race and diversity in politics. She's an author, an adjunct professor at Howard and Georgetown Universities, a syndicated newspaper columnist and a contributor to Fox News. In short, there's no one quite like Donna Brazil, and we are thrilled to have her with us tonight. Donna, welcome. Thank you, Lauren, and welcome to Black Women Lead. I'm Donna Brazil, and I'm so pleased to be the host of tonight's program presented by All In Together in partnership with OWN, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, Higher Heights, and the LBJ Foundation. It's a powerful and important moment for Black women's leadership in America. And tonight's program highlights some of the many places and spaces where Black women are having a transformational effect on our country and society at large. Of course, we are here following the election of the first woman, the first Black woman, the first Indian American woman, Vice President Kamala Harris is reason enough to celebrate but there are just so many Black women doing extraordinary things that our program could never be long enough to celebrate them all. Tonight, we will explore the importance of Black women in political office by hearing from three powerful elected Black women, California Congresswoman Karen Bass and Barbara Lee, and the nation's only Black woman speaker of a state Senate, Andrea Stewart Cousins of New York. They will speak with Glenda Carr, CEO of Higher Heights about the impact they are having on politics today and the work ahead. Harry Cole will explore the role artists play as activists leading social change through art. She will speak with actors Tina Leifert and Don Leanne Gardner from OWN's hit show, Queen Sugar. And we are thrilled to have superstar ballerina, Misty Copeland. We will explore the power of Black women's voices in the media with Jamel Hill, who will speak with Twitter executive Guardians Riviera about how they are each changing and shaping the media world. And we will hear from three of the nation's most important voices on criminal justice reform. Black Future Labs Principal Alicia Garza, New York Attorney General Letitia James, and Deborah Archer, President of the ACLU. Finally, I am thrilled to have a conversation with Golden Globe winner, Academy Award nominated actress and singer songwriter, Andra Day to talk about the power of her astonishing role in the movie, The United States versus Billie Holiday and her commitment to art with the power 
to transform. It will be a powerful program, so stay with us. As a reminder, the full bios of all of tonight's speakers are available on the All In Together website. And to be sure to stay connected to the program on Twitter using our hashtags, Black Women Lead and All In Together. Following the program, please also join us on Twitter Spaces for live conversations with some of tonight's speakers. We are so thrilled that this program is happening in partnership with OWN, the premier Black Center entertainment destination. It's now my great pleasure to welcome President of OWN, Tina Perry, to share a few remarks. Named president in 2019, she oversees all operations and creative areas of the network reporting to Chairman and CEO, Oprah Winfrey. Her leadership is a driving force behind the network's ongoing evolution to become the leading destination for Black audiences. Please join me in welcoming Tina. Thank you, Donna, for that kind introduction. And thank you to All In Together for putting on this great program. I'm honored to be here with you and the incredible women featured tonight. At OWN, we are always striving to meet our audience where she is and to serve her needs. We do this every day through our programming, and we have recently expanded our mission to serve our community through initiatives that address key issues, starting last year with our first ever Get Out the Vote campaign, Own Your Vote. The success of this campaign led us to consider other ways that we can get involved with our community to make a difference on the most pressing issues Black women face today. So we are very excited to share with you our first Own Your Health initiative, a campaign partnering with national and local health equity leaders to provide tools and resources that will empower Black women to own their health in 2021 and beyond. Own Your Health aims to bring awareness, education, resources, and a sense of community to address the unique health concerns facing Black women today. This is a multi-platform campaign designed to inspire and encourage the own audience to put herself and her health and well-being first. The campaign leads with a powerful narrative and action exploring the full range of mental and physical and emotional health by launching new initiatives quarterly with messaging, impact, and tools that are informed, educational, relevant, and up-to-date with the latest developments as it relates to health and wellness. We all know Black women have higher rates of some illnesses that are often attributed to less access to local healthcare providers, fewer early screenings for prevention, and lack of proper follow-up care. Additionally, Black health disparities often exist as a result of systematic racism within the United States healthcare system, racial segregation of neighborhoods, and racism related chronic stress. A year of tragic and traumatic anniversaries, COVID 19, and a lack of Black female healthcare providers and specialists are other key considerations affecting health outcomes in the Black community in 2021. Finally, we know that Black women are leaders and financial decision makers in their households. So simply put, when a Black woman's health is jeopardized, it impacts her, her family, and her community. We want Black women to know we see you and will support you each and every day. We are excited to launch this important initiative and hope you'll join us in partnership. Take a look at Own Your Health. Look in the mirror, proud of who's looking back at you. Do you find the life you're living? Not by what you take, but what you're giving. And if you bet on love, there's no way you'll ever lose. Take a stand, make a stand for what's right. It's always worth, always worth the fight. As we build a better future, as we break down barriers, as we claim our power, we must never forget our single greatest asset, our health. 
Rise up, love, lift your hands. I stand with you, cause I understand. Ain't here to judge, just to take a stand. Let's all rise like the day began. Before you take care of anyone or anything else, you have to take care of yourself first. It to be an example for our sisters, our brothers, our mothers, our fathers, our children, our friends, our communities. It's time to thrive. It's time own your health. Thank you, Tina, and thank you, Om, for your support of this program. Now to start off tonight's program, it's my pleasure to welcome Tanya Vizi. Since July, 2020, she has served as the president of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, working to advance the influence of African-Americans in research and public policy. Tanya, welcome. Thank you, Donna. The Congressional Black Caucus Foundation is proud to partner with All In Together and all of tonight's presenting partners on this important program. I am so pleased to introduce our dynamic panel of incredibly impactful Black women. Congresswoman Karen Bass is in her sixth term representing California's 37th Congressional District. She serves as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus in 2019 and 2020, introducing the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. Before her tenure in Congress, Bass was the first African-American woman in US history to serve as speaker of any state legislature. Congresswoman Barbara Lee is in her 12th congressional term representing California's 13th congressional district. She is the only African-American woman in congressional democratic leadership serving as co-chair of the policy and steering committee. She also serves on the Budget Committee and the Powerful Appropriations Committee. State Senator Andrea Stewart-Cousins is President Pro Tem and Majority Leader of the New York State Senate, where she has served since 2006. In 2012, she became the first woman and first African-American woman to lead a New York State Legislative Conference. And in 2019, she was elected by her peers as temporary president and majority leader of the state Senate. Moderating this discussion is Glenda Carr. She is co-founder of Higher Heights Leadership Fund, which provides organizing resources for politically active Black women for the past eight years, she has served as president and CEO. She is also the co-creator of the hashtag Black Women Lead and hashtag Black Women Vote movements, helping to elect 11 Black women to US Congress in the first Black woman to serve as New York State Attorney General. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Karen Bass, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Senator Andrea Stewart-Cousins, and Glenda Carr. We know that Black women lead. We've been lead leading since the dawn of time. Um, Black women's representation matters in this moment. Um, we have seen record gains in the number of Black women running, winning, and leading. Um, the 117th Congress has the largest number of black women serving in the House of Representatives. We currently don't have a black woman, black woman serving in the US Senate. In fact, we've seen gains in the number of black women running in state legislatures in this country. Currently, there are 317 black women at the end of 2020 who are serving in state, state legislative positions. <laughs> We also have seen a gain in the number of black women serving as mayors. So in 2014, there was only two black women serving as mayors of major cities. We now have seven, but there's still work to be done. As I mentioned, there's zero black women currently in the US Senate. We've actually only had two black women ever serve in that position in 1992. 
Karen Mosley Braun was the first black woman to ever be elected and serve in the US Senate. And 24 years later, Kamala Harris um, was elected from California. And our conversation today actually has two black women um, who are currently serving in the House of Representatives from California. So some about that California water. Uh, and we know that there's still work to be done. We've never elected a black woman governor in this country's history. We currently only have six black women serving in statewide executive offices. And we've only had 16 ever serve in this country's history. So today we're having a conversation about black women leading as candidates, as community leaders and as amazing elected leaders who are putting forth some of the most progressive legislative priorities and budget priorities in our country's history. So I am so excited to be in conversation with my two, two of my three favorite uh, congressional members from California, Karen Bass uh, and Barbara Lee, who again are example of pipeline work. These are women that were community leaders who served in a state legislature and now boldly serving in Washington. And my New York state majority leader, Andre Stewart Cousins. And so, you know, people ask why black women and why do black women lead? Can you share a little bit, um, Rep Bass, the importance of representation and why black women's voices matter um, at decision-making tables across this country? Well, absolutely. And thank you so much for inviting me to participate with this, especially with my esteemed colleagues here who are playing incredible leadership roles. It is important for Black women to be at the table and be in leadership because of what we represent in terms of the issues that we have worked on. I mean, there were many Black women who were leaders in the civil rights movement. It's just that they weren't acknowledged. So we have always been there leading. What is wonderful about this period in history is that our leadership is being acknowledged. Linda, thank you so much, uh, and thank you. Uh, Hiller Heights certainly is leading. I remember when you first started, and you have done amazing work to just get us to where we are. And yes, I'm so proud to be here with my two colleagues who continue to uh, break new glass ceilings each and every day. Uh, yes, I got involved in politics through the leadership and mentorship of Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. Black women's lens, their perspective, our background, our experiences, really bring forth uh, the ability to have new policies that not only deal with uh, systemic racism and racial and gender inequalities, but what we do is help strengthen the black community, communities of color and the entire country. Uh, you mentioned uh, the U.S. Senate, Senate seat. No African-American women currently serve in the US, U.S. Senate. But in total, the first Congress seated in 1789. Now check this, it's only been 10 years since 1789 that a black woman's perspective has been in the United States Senate. I tell you, our country would be much stronger had we had black women in the Senate since 1789. And so representation matters because we bring our perspective, we bring a broader uh, lens, we bring a lens of inclusivity, and equality to each and every public policy and each and every agenda, wherever we are, uh, whatever space we occupy. Thank you so much. And it is really such an honor and a pleasure to be with my two wonderful Congresswomen. Uh, and, and thank you for what you do. And of course, Glenda, uh, you know, Higher Heights has been just a part of so many women's ascent in this political world. Why does it matter? Because Black women have experienced everything you could imagine. We have been marginalized, we have been underestimated, we have been taken for granted. And for us to be in leadership positions, we have already proven that we have figured out by the grace of God, how to make a way out of no way. And what we do is we lift while we climb. And so when we are put in these positions, we cannot forget the, the, the tears and the hardships and the pain of our ancestors and the past and the shoulders that we stand on, such as the wonderful Shirley Chisholm and so many more. And we know that these opportunities cannot be squandered and we know what it is to be left behind. So we bring all that with us and we make sure that when we're here, people know we're here 
and we make a road so that it'll be easier for the next people to travel on. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I definitely believe that um, your leadership comes from the Barbara Jordans, the Shirley Chisholms of the world, um, the activists of, you know, Ida B. Wells and um, Fannie Lee Lou Hamer. Um, I mentioned the gains we've made, but I've also showed the opportunities that exist because there's still barriers that, I say that there's still institutional barriers that exist and man-made obstacles that are, exist for women's leadership, political leadership, or particularly black women's leadership. So I wanna share a little bit about your vision of what do we need to do to ensure that we are encouraging black women to run for office and, and more importantly, that we're investing and in supporting uh, in their ability to run for office for the first time, but frankly, building that pipeline, that Karen Bass, that um, uh, Barbara Lee, pipeline of being an activist to a, a, a local leader to a national leader. Um, it's the Kamala Harris effect and the Tish James effect, right? So Vice President Kamala Harris ran and won on the local level, on the statewide executive level, on the federal level, and is now serving on the national level. Um, uh, Attorney General Latish Tish James has served as a city council member on the local level, citywide elected office in New York City, and is now serving um, at, on the statewide executive level. So what do we need to do to go beyond thanking Black women and investing in Black women uh, rep fast? Well, first of all, organize. <laughs> that is absolutely what we need to do. And, you know, as I speak alongside of my two colleagues who are both, you know, I was just sitting here thinking about are the highest ranking African-American women in their legislative bodies. Representative Lee certainly is. And I know our majority leader, Cousins, is as well. And so we need to organize. And the majority leader mentioned lift as you climb. I think it is the obligation of all of us because we understand that the fight for social and economic justice never ends. I would like to say that we win voting rights and we never have to think about it again because we've been fully integrated into our democracy, but that's not the case. So since the struggle never ends, it's our obligation to make sure that we focus and pay attention to the generation coming up and that we do everything we need to do to make sure that they can follow in our footsteps and not just in elected office, but there's so many ways that with so many examples of leadership, organizations, unions, corporations, et cetera, we need to lead everywhere. Yes, and you know, I think, uh... When you look at African-American women and, and how we got to where we are, those of us who are elected or have broken glass ceilings in whatever space, you look at uh, Congresswoman Bass and uh, Senator Cousins and just see uh, how their activism, and, and yes, Karen's one of the best organizers in the country, how organize it and, be, and remain in an activist regardless of whether you're elected or not, regardless of whether you're in a professional position or not, you have to keep that activism uh, spirit with you. And in doing that, you're bringing other women along, other black women. Uh, for instance, if you're um, an elected official, you know what it takes to raise money. It is a heck of a, we have a heck of a hard time to raise money. And so what do we do? We need to find new ways to develop. And you know that Glenda uh, packs, uh, ways to raise lower donor uh, contributions, larger contributions for black women. And we have to mentor black women and make sure that we support them when they do run for office or do make that next step to whatever they want to do. Finally, I'll just say, and we must hire African-American women in positions where they have non-traditionally been. And it's our job, if we've made it through whatever ceiling that we've made it through, then we want other black women to make it through those glass ceilings that they need to still shatter. And so it's up to us who uh, have, um, you know, move forward through the grace of God and, and the mentorship of people like Shirley Chisholm to do the same thing for other African American women. And I know that Vice President Kamala Harris uh, would not have been our vice president had it not been for Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm and other black women who, who open the doors and uh, open them wide so that uh, she could become the vice president and it's up to her and it's up to all of us to do the same thing. Yeah. And that's the work of Higher Heights. You know, I, I don't know if y'all know that it is our 10th anniversary of wow. Kimberly Peeler Allen, who's the other co-founder and I, 
having coffee. Like we weren't trying to start an organization. We literally had coffee because I was trying to figure out my next steps. Um, and out of that coffee, we were like, what do we build? How do we build something that looks like us, that is for us? Um, and we wrote the words higher heights down for the first time. But some of that was just based on our personal relationships. Um, and it's certainly because of the Andre Stewart cousins, um, who again, served on a local level. And if we didn't reorganize for her second run for Senate, she wouldn't be the majority leader. Um, she lost by 18 votes uh, in her first election. So Andrea, share a little bit about your journey. I sound like I'm crying, but I actually need something to drink, but I can cry over Andrea Stewart Cousins every day. <laughs> and I could cry over the 10 years because I, I know I was one of the founding members of Higher Heights. And you're talking about that, you know, I mean, we talk about activism. A lot of times we, we think of people marching or, they, you know, but the activism of sitting down with a sister girl over a cup of coffee saying, how are we going to make this? That's activism too. I'm in this role, not because I thought I was going to be a great political leader. I never thought about it. I moved to a town that in the 1990s were fighting, fighting desegregation in New York. And all of a sudden, I found myself in the middle of trying to help not only a friend of mine who was running for city council to be the first African-American woman city council woman, Simmer Brandon, but I found myself fighting to get the one out of three candidates who was willing to desegregate the city of Yonkers in 1992. So that's how I got in. And I think so many people don't realize that what they're doing in their communities, what they're doing on their block, what they're doing in their churches or whatever, is organizing and is the seed of activism. And you bring that with you when you're fighting a fight on behalf of not just yourself, but of others, and people see you as a leader, it matters. So, so we can all bring and mentor uh, young women by reminding them that they are probably doing this work anyway. The other thing I know that my sisters were talking about, um, not only mentoring, but hiring black women, and I, now that I'm in this position, when I first became came leader, because first I was the minority leader, and now, now it's the, the, the uh, president of the Senate and the majority leader, uh, when people come to see me, they bring people with them who look like me, usually. You know, they are very conscious that they are coming in, and they're seeing a, a woman, and they're seeing a woman of color. And all of a sudden, the diversity that you never saw in the capital in New York, say, you know, 10, 15, and you forget before that, all of a sudden you see the doors have opened because people understand how important it is to see representation. So consciously we should be doing it, mentoring, you know, I hire uh, a certainly, you know, women and women of color and, and uh, have interns, but also I know that my presence has started to open doors where those doors have been closed before. It makes me happy. I can't believe that this conversation is about to come to a close. And so this is rapid fire. Um, Shirley Chisholm once said, you don't make progress by whimpering and complaining on the sidelines. You make progress by implementing ideas. So for those who are watching today and particularly to the black women who are wa watching, what is the one word you would leave them as they're thinking about potentially running for office or running for higher office. I'll give y'all three words. One might be hard. Persevere, be hopeful. Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta say faith, resilience, courage. Well, thank you for being Black women who lead um, in our legislatures across the states, like Andrea Stewart Cousins, our majority leader from New York. And thank you to the bold leadership of Representative Karen Bass and Barbara Lee for boldly leading in the corridors of the Capitol in Washington. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Diversity and inclusion is not just a nicety, it's a necessity. 
What inclusion means to me is being able to wake up every day just knowing that you are comfortable and respected. I really appreciate that State Street has a plethora of employee resource groups here. I have been a beneficiary of a lot of the programs that um, State Street supports. I am able to bring my full self here and my colleagues are able to bring their full selves and when we all do that we're performing at our best. It was so easy to just say this is a company I want to work for. I am a black professional from a small island in the Caribbean. I'm a diversity and inclusion champion. Thank you, Glenda, Representative Bass and Lee, and Senator Stewart Cousins for that fantastic conversation. We cannot stop until we have greater representation of black women elected office everywhere. Thank you for doing your part to make that a reality. It's now my pleasure to introduce Harriet Cole, who will be leading our artists as activist discussion. Harriet is an author, nationally syndicated advice columnist, motivational speaker and storytelling coach. Harriet started her career at Essence Magazine and later served as creative director and editor in chief of Ebony. She will be speaking with two stars of OWN's hit show, Queen Sugar, Tina Lightfoot, plays Aunt Vi in Queen Sugar, but she has starred in many shows in television and film. Don Leanne Gardner is best known for her role as Charlie Bordelon in Queen Sugar, but last year she launched Belong, a public conversation about belonging and political engagement. Please join me in welcoming Harriet, Tina, and Don Leanne. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Such an honor to be here. And today we are going to have an incredible conversation with two stars from Owns Queen Sugar. Don't you love that show? And I love it because it's rich in our history and shows a depiction of black life that we don't often see. So the two stars who are with us today are Tina Lifford, who plays Aunt Ba, and Don Leanne Gardner, who plays Charlie. Welcome, ladies. Mm, hey, Harriet, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you oh. for having us, such a pleasure. Absolutely. And, you know, we we are looking at the power of art to bring voice to our stories and how incredible it can be when we tell Black stories through a Black lens. And that is exactly what Queen Sugar does. Uh, Tina, I'd like to start with you to just give a frame for what you have seen over these seasons of being part of Queen Sugar and bringing uh, this one family, but you know, it's bigger than the one family story to life. Yeah, you know, I, I think that one of the many things that uh, impresses me and also uh, gives me great pride uh, with regards to Queen Sugar is the way in which the rich storytelling not only gives us access to ourselves, but I really feel it touches a deep memory point inside of us when community and family held a much bigger place of safety and identity within the community. And um, just watching the board alone work together, um, you know, fight the way in which family, you know, disagrees and love, it touches more than just the present moment. It really does open us up to a past that has, has in the past held us strong. It's interesting too, because we know that many people who are not black don't have a good sense of what black culture and black family life is. You know, we, we see these stereotypical images of the broken Black family. But it, through Queen Sugar, we get to see many nuances of what Black family and community are like. What do you, what do you think that impact is having on viewers, Tina? Well, you know, I am seeing the family that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't a Southern family but I am seeing the dynamics, not just within the family, but within the community. And I remember the sense of 
pride and identity that I received from growing up in the small town of Evanston, Illinois. And, you know, cellularly, we hold on to everything. So I think that when people, when Black people get to see themselves in a way that they recognize, even if, unfortunately, they maybe didn't grow up in a family that was as tight and committed as the Bordelons are, there is a place in their history or in their community where that was so. And seeing it allows us to relax in a certain way and be open and lean into it. And I think that that is really powerful because it, it, sort of tills the internal soil in a way that allows people who, you know, have been in survival mode and struggle mode and disconnect from self to experience a cellular sense of remembering, even if they don't know exactly what's going on. Good point. And Don, Leanne, your character plays a role that often occurs in Black families. You know, they're people in different socioeconomic uh, relationships to each other and the friction that can often occur. And I'm curious about depicting this woman who's, you know, being in family, sometimes separated from family and having to grapple with having means that may be different from other family members. And, you know, what, what bringing that story to life because it does often create a lot of friction within a family. Yeah, <clears throat> I think part of what has been so wonderful about being able to play a woman like Charlie Bordelon um, is that it is very true to life. It is very, um, it's, it's a dimensional depiction of both what, exactly what you said, the socioeconomic differences that can exist in a Black family that can cause friction, but also the very personal relationship that someone can have to that, to their own ability to uh, move through those those socioeconomic levels and others' ability potentially not to do that as easily, to not have that kind of access. Um, I think the what I've been enjoying the most about uh, playing her and about that part of her is her own sort of transformation in the last five seasons, really. We've seen her enter you know, the show or we've entered the show with her um, much less aware of, of, of her own relationship to all of that, <clears throat> much less aware of her own relationship to the rest of the family and their relationships to all of that. Um, and part of what I feel like is the opportunity of Charlie is to ask those questions and examine those dynamics and, and to really allow it to be um, a point of change or a point, an opportunity for change, an opportunity for, uh, for transformation. For me personally, art and storytelling, that's that's the beauty of it is that it always has transformative potential. And so with Charlie, we've literally watched this woman walk in back into Louisiana, back into her family space, um, truly not as interested in, um, in that relationship, in, in, in community as a point of identity. And we've watched over these, over these seasons, her um, embracing community and finding a sense of self that was not relying on her socioeconomic status. And in fact, challenging her own relationship to that and really seeking to, in some ways, um, fight for and equalize you know, um, the access that people have in, in her community to that, to that, that ability to, to move. So I, I feel like Charlie um, is very <laughs> exceptionally recognizable um, to, to black folks in this country because we either are her or know her. And, um, and she represents, I think, um, really what we've seen in terms of a historical movement, um, both for socioeconomic and access and power, but also um, something of a return to community and a fight for, for those who are still struggling and, and trying to, to move through their own um, socioeconomic level. So it's, I, I feel very, very honored to have um, shepherded her in that way. It's powerful, powerful role. And, you know, all artists who are fortunate enough to be working on projects through this 
period that we've been living in of a year of quarantine uh, have had to face, can I work? Am I working? And then the creators, what's the storyline? Ava DuVernay went in with this new season, really changing things up and, and examining what's been happening uh, over this past year. Can, can you talk about what your experience is of moving into this season with this refreshed awareness and storytelling that is really in alignment with uh, being on the pulse of what's happening right now. I'll start with you, Tina, and then we'll, we'll go to uh, Don Leon. Yeah, you know, um, I am always in awe of the creative journey. And uh, Ava DuVernay really is very aligned with the times. And I just think, think that it is um, a blessing <laughs> that she was able to take this very, very challenging period in our uh, world and use it, you know, instead of doing the easy thing of going, on, going along with the scripts that had already been written, she took a beat and that beat, I'm sure, you know, has a, a, an economic impact, you know, because it wasn't planned on. But they went in and totally rewrote season five. And what they did was they met people, they met our audience where it's living, the, where the audience is living. It met people in terms of all the struggles, the varying struggles that we have had. And you could only do that if you were willing to sort of lean into the magic of the creative process and knowing that in order to connect to people, in order to truly be of service, you have to let people see themselves where they are, feel themselves as they are feeling and experience themselves um, in ways that they maybe aren't giving themselves per permission, but by simply being able to see the Bordelones experiencing this COVID journey, a greater personal uh, experience and presence is provided. And that is, for me, the ultimate act of creativity and the creative process. Look, this is incredible. We just got to have a tiny little taste of being <laughs> with these formidable women. Thank you so much, Tina Lifford and Don Leanne Gardner. Hey guys, watch Queen Sugar. It's amazing. And also check out their projects. Uh, they are not just acting, they are walking the talk. We thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for having us. <laughs> He asked for his mother. I don't understand. Remember that talk we had about George Floyd? Where are you going, Micah? To where he was killed. He wanted his mother with him. Hollywood's in a bad place. We gotta keep family close. So he called out to her. He was scared and he loved her. Stay uncomfortable. Stay listening. Stay trying. <laughs> Sometimes when we're scared, we call out to the ones that make us feel safe. I need help. We're marching so that what happened to Mr. Floyd doesn't happen to anyone else. Queen Sugar, Tuesdays, 8, 7 central. Thank you, Tina and Don Lien for that great conversation. Now, Harriet continues our artist conversation with her friend, ballerina Misty Copeland. Misty needs little introduction, but if for some reason you don't know her, she is the principal dancer of the American Ballet Theater. Misty was promoted to principal dancer in 2015, becoming the first black woman principal dancer in the company's 75 year history. In addition to her ballet career, Misty is also a best-selling author and dedicated mentor to young boys and girls. Now back to Harriet and welcome Misty. Thank you so much. Can I just let you know how delighted I am to be in conversation with my friend, Misty Copeland. Welcome Misty. Thank you. It's so good to see you, Harriet. Um, it's, you know, I, I, I want to hug you across the great divide. Yes, yes, yes. I know that so many of us want to have that physical connection, but this is the best that we can do. And I know it's great. You know, we make the best of every moment, right? 
So I have to start, Misty, with I remember exactly when I met you, which was during the Welcome to America tour that Prince had back in 2010 and 11. Yes. And well, how I first met you was on watching you on stage. And for those who may not recall this, Prince was playing the piano, this giant grand piano, and Misty comes dancing in. And literally, I still don't know how you did this, jumps up on top of the baby grand piano on point and twirls and dances. And it was the most electrifying experience for everyone. And then, and then there you were off and dancing around with him. And it was just, what was electrifying about it though, Misty, was the power that you had. Mm -hmm. That you, you know, we know physically, you, you are not a tall person, right? Most ballerinas are not, you are not, but you took up the entire stage. There's something about your performance that I saw then and consistently about the way that you invoke your inner power and, and have it fill space that is just really magnificent. And, and I'd love for you to talk about how you access that power. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You know, I feel like um, I've always had this kind of bubbling up inside of me as a young person and, and, and no real way to access it and articulate it. Um, and, and it wasn't really until I found ballet at, at a later age at 13 years old that I really started to understand how to access that power. And it gave me a voice and confidence in a way that I'd never experienced just being the shy introverted girl that I was growing up um, and not having a lot of opportunity. But once I was, um, I don't know, titillated <laughs> by all of the incredible black women, you included, that came into my life and allowed me to see my worth and um, and what I could be. And, and, you know, Prince was a part of that. And I think that when I started working with him, um, something different came out of me. And, and that may be what you experienced or saw was, um, you know, he gave me an understanding of what it meant to be a black artist, what it meant to be an individual, to be unique, and to own that and to use that power for good. And I think that, you know, coming from the world that I do, where I was the only black woman at American Ballet Theater for the first 11 years of my career, um, you know, a lot of it was just like, how do I blend in? Um, and Prince, Prince allowed me to see uh, the beauty in not blending in. Uh, and, um, and, I, and that's kind of working against what we're taught and told to see and look for in ballet, especially if you're not the star of the ballet. Um, but he gave me a different confidence and energy and all of the amazing mentors that I have, I think allowed me to see, um, beyond my, the physicality in the, in the, in the package that I come in, but what I can make people feel. It's interesting that you say that. I mean, Prince was an incredible visionary and what I remember so many things, but one of the things I remember is that he could see so far down the line and he'd be like, don't you see it? He, because I remember when he was saying to me, Misty needs to be on the cover of Essence. Misty needs to be a principal dancer. These things need to happen now. Why haven't they happened? I mean, he was so intense about this. And this was, I think, five years before you became a principal dancer. He's like, it, don't you see it? It is obvious. And it is so important to have people like that in our lives because I do, I agree with you that having that energy, I'm sure helped to push you out of whatever shyness you had, um, which was, we went, he, I sat in the booth with him one night watching you perform. And the moment that you put your foot on the stage, he looked at me and he says, see, she's here. Don't you feel it? the energy changed? Which, which is true. And when you talk about the business of being a dancer, and especially in the early days, you know, when you're part of the corps de ballet, right? You're supposed to look like everybody else. You're supposed to have the same moves. And yet this, this uh, quest for finding your uniqueness and allowing it to pour forth is also there. Can you recall 
possibly when you felt that shift within you? And, and was it Firebird? Was it before that? When did you feel that shift of fully claiming all of you on stage? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I had moments where I went in and out, you know, even as a young person, um, being on stage was the first time that I felt alive and vibrant and beautiful. So the stage was always that place for me where, um, you know, I, I couldn't hear any feedback. There wasn't the ballet master or mistress in front of the room telling me what to do and what to change. And um, I, you can't see the audience, you know, in a in a theater like like the Metropolitan Opera House. It's all black out there. And there was something so comforting for me where I felt like I'm just in this amazing fantasy bubble and I can just be me where I don't feel any judgment or like I'm going to be hurt in any way, which I feel like a lot of my life, I've kind of shielded myself to not be hurt or judged. Um, so I think being on stage, you know, I, I've come in and out of that, that feeling. But, um, you know, again, I think it was throughout the time that I spent on on the road and on stage with Prince that I really started to, to own that um you know and then starting working with my manager gilda i think she was also someone who saw in me all of this potential and what could be and it was about like why can't everyone else see this like this is an amazing positive story uh, an example for for young for the black youth for the youth period to see you know that you know a, a lot of the time black women are just depicted in such a negative way and in, in the media and, um, you know, she was someone who believed in me and saw all of this potential. And, and I, I'm living out this theme that she had, which is unbelievable. But I think that the Firebird was definitely a turning point um, for me internally. And, and but but it, it was more about, I think, the community coming out and, and representing and showing their understanding of what I represented, which was is so much bigger than me. But that first performance of, of the Firebird in New York City uh, was the first time that I saw that many black and brown people in the theater at Lincoln Center at the Metropolitan Opera House. And it's kind of from that moment on just changed. The moment, you know, I was up there doing the lead in a classical work and my community could see themselves through me, see what it should have been for so many, see what's possible for the future of so many. and and the investment in, in this art form now makes sense for them. You know, we belong in this space too. That's right. And, and Misty, one of the things you did right away, you know, you, you claimed a certain space of power there and then you immediately helped, uh, created a program with ABT to help bring more black women, black and brown women into the fold. Can you quickly tell me about that program? Yeah, it's actually, I mean, I'm so proud of, the fact that it did grow into what it did grow into it's shifted and changed now and it's become something else um that i think is going to take on you know other legs and and become something more um but project plie was initially the diversity initiative that i helped to um to start with american ballet theater but it was trying you know there's so many diversity initiatives out there and and have been for from the beginning of time like you know people I think some wanting to wanting to do good work, but I think for a lot of it, especially in in classical dance, um, has been you know what brown face can we put on the front of this this initiative, and are we really doing the work? Um, and I wanted to make sure that the work was really being done. Um, but you know, it was really about reaching out to communities that don't have the access, that don't have the means to be a part of this, and showing them. Uh, that they belong in this space and you know it was bringing teachers to them so educating teachers in community centers or local public schools that are in their communities to me that's one of the biggest things when you're looking at um, you know the root of the issues of the lack of diversity I mean it's from the top and the bottom you know you think about representation in the board of directors the artistic staff the right. education Department, all of that, and then it trickles down, and it's in the schools. If you don't have access and make and, and and have teachers that look like the students they're teaching and an understanding of where they come from and their background, um, then there's no way to create a real nurturing environment. 
Uh, so, you know, b beyond that, like that's something that I think is a part of what I want my legacy to be, you know, with my own foundation, starting, starting my own foundation and um, really building on just giving back to my community. That's wonderful. And Misty, I know one of the things that I appreciate so much about you is whatever happens in life, you face it and pivot and figure out a way forward that is really empowering. So going back to Firebird, this incredible moment in history, you described all of people of color embracing you, and then you got injured. And I'm going to say, I know, thank goodness for Gilda Squire, because you got injured, you have to get yourself healed, you had the best doctors, but you weren't just home healing. <laughs> and that began the books that now I believe you have published seven books. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Seven books, all empowerment. I mean, because we're what we're talking about here is artists, activists, you know, standing in your power. At each point when you have needed to pivot, you've created something for the community. Can you talk a bit about your intention behind that? You know, I I don't ever feel like these are things that I like sit at home. I mean, some of them, yes, but that I'm like, okay, what's what's next? What can I do? Like if something goes goes wrong in my career, but things just naturally, I think, and organically happen because um, because I care, <laughs> because I really care, and um, and it's kind of just trying to find new ways of doing things that are going to make an impact so you know when it came to that injury um you know which i thought could, it could have been career ending but it was like what can i do internally for myself and it was sitting down and writing it was processing everything i had never had time to process in my i think at that point it was like 50 13 year career. Um, and then that kind of evolved into like, well, how can sharing this be good for my community? Um, and then the children's books came and it was like the, the representation of, you know, being a black woman, a black author, a ballerina being depicted in a positive light in children's books, all of that. I mean, um, just every opportunity I have to kind of step back and think, you know, what can I, what else can I do? You know, I'm looking at even just this time within the pandemic and um, this is the longest, even with all the injuries I've had, the longest I've been away from the stage mm -hmm. and probably the most out of shape I've ever been <laughs> in, in my life. That's true for all of us, Misty, but it's totally different. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I feel like it's been a moment for me to to view my strengths and power and voice in a different way. You know, I'm so used to it being a, through performance and on the stage. And, um, you know, I feel like it's been a moment for me to step back and lend my support to help lift the voices of other black and brown dancers and artists who maybe have felt that there would be some backlash or there's just no way they can have a voice and express their experiences because uh, black people often are just not believed, heard or seen. And I feel like, you know, since the murder of George Floyd, it's been a real opportunity for me to kind of support the next generation and allowing for them to have a voice and a platform. And um, yeah, it's just I, I'm in a different place than I was even a year ago. And it, it kind of all just is about um, just thinking of, of new and more invigorating ways to to give back. And I just I can't just sit back and just be stale in the same old same old ways, especially if I don't see change happening. So there's a lot of exciting things on on the you know table right now for me. Um, and again, they're all things that I think will help move my art form forward. Thank you, Misty. I'm so proud of you. So glad that you are who you are and that you're offering so much to the community to make sure that we are all uplifted. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Harriet. <laughs>
think you know what happens next. Ask yourself why. These are the black stories we've been shown. A narrow view that limits our understanding. But there's so much more to see. Let's widen the screen so we can widen our view. Thank you all so much. These conversations are fantastic and there's more to come. Please stay with us for the Golden Globe winner and Oscar nominee, Andrew Day, coming up late in our program. As a reminder, the full bios for all of our speakers are posted on the All In Together website. And be sure to follow our program on Twitter with the hashtag Black Women Lead and All In Together. Now, Jamel Hill speaks with Twitter Global Director of Community and Culture, God is Riviera, about the power of Black women's voices in the media. Jamel Hill is an award-winning journalist and writer for The Atlantic. She spent 12 years at ESPN. She now hosts her own podcast, Jamel Hill is Unbothered, focusing on the intersection of sports, race, and gender. And she is the co-host of Karen Jamel Won't Stick to Sports on Vice. Goddess Riviera is Global Director, Culture and Community at Twitter. Named as one in Fortune's 40 Under 40, she works to amplify and celebrate diverse voices on Twitter and beyond. Please join me in welcoming Jamel Hill and God is Riviera. Well, thank you, Donna. I am so excited to have this conversation with the one, the only, the OG, Miss Jamel Hill, just, I mean, I can't even, like, there's so many words to describe all that you do. Um, you're, you know, a journalist, you're a podcaster, just, I feel like the one I like the most is a force. Um, <laughs> and so, yes, right? Okay, just, I, I receive it, like, I receive it. <laughs> <laughs> we, need to, we need to put it all together, um, and all that you do. So I'm so excited to talk to you today, girl. How are you doing? I'm doing well, and I really thank you for such a kind and warm introduction. It, it's funny because whenever I'm introduced, I always have the same reaction every single time. Doesn't matter how many conversations similar to these that I'm in, I always think to myself, who the hell are they talking about? <laughs> it cannot be me. <laughs> it is, it is. That's why I'm, I'm glad you received it because we're going to give you flowers today. So, yes, and I, you know, I think about just when I started following you on these Twitter streets, I feel like a decade ago, like, um, it's crazy, right? Just you start to feel as like you almost know someone. And as you, you know, did so much of your career, it's like, we're all rooting for you. So it's, been, it's great to have this conversation face to face. I know we have a lot of mutual friends. TJ is a good friend of mine. <laughs> shout out to TJ. Yeah, shout TJ. out to TJ. Gotta shout him out. So I'm glad that we finally connected. So how about we get into it? I want to talk today about something you know everything about, which is why it is important for Black women to be heard, use their voice. So I thought we could talk a little bit about your career, a little bit about what you're doing now, and just kind of dig in. Sound good? Oh, that sounds great. All right. Okay. So you, let, I like these words. So let, let's keep it going. We said force, but now I'm going to use one. Actually, TJ and I were saying this one together. You were a behemoth, like at a machine at ESPN. Like, I mean... Just, uh, you know, thinking about your career and you made your own kind of herstory. I love kind of putting that play on it, not not through the, the male lens, right? 
um, you had your own show with his and hers, you know, on Sports Center. What I loved about the show is it was black as hell. Okay, <laughs> like you, y'all kept it real. I was looking at some clips the other day. We I'm did. Like, really put a pie in that man's face to get him, <laughs> <laughs> to get him back for that yeah. little paper incident. Um, but it just yeah. felt like it was my cousins and them up there. You know, like. So I just would love to know a little bit from you, just what was it like? You know, I know it came off to us as fun and informative, and but you were you were breaking ceilings, like, you know, busting through them. What was it like to kind of be in that moment? You know, why was it so important for you, especially as a Black woman, um, to have a voice in, in spaces like that where we kind of hadn't seen that before? Um, can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, my time at ESPN was was very unique because I came in as a writer. I left as a television person. So even though during my final months at ESPN, I had transitioned back to the writing side, but the, that by that time, more people knew me as a television personality. And they say sometimes that ignorance is bliss. Usually that has a negative connotation, but in my case, it had a very positive outcome. I never wanted to, it was to me. It wasn't something I desired. I wanted to be a writer through and through. And so I think what helped me was that when I started doing television, I was always myself because I never expected the TV thing to ever last that long, to be honest. And yeah, and, and Mike was a little different than me because he was a far more seasoned television person. Uh, my co-host, uh, Michael Smith, was a far more seasoned television person when we came together for his and hers. But nevertheless, because of the way we got the show and the way we got the show, executives deciding like, here's two very funny, smart black people. Let's put them on TV because they have good chemistry. It didn't happen that way. We basically won the war of attrition and we were able to get the show, uh, start his and hers. And because of the way we came into it, our motto used to be, we selling tapes out the trunk. Okay, so mm, I know that we, <laughs> we were we like we out here slanging like okay. slanging these opinions, you know what I'm right. saying? Right, and you want to your five dollars? Right, exactly. <laughs> we out there like the the people who selling their CDs and their demos outside of the outside of the store or whatever business. Um, but we, it was really important to us that we do what we thought was good TV, what we thought was authentic to who we were. Given that we didn't even expect to have this platform together, our uh, whole mentality was that if we were going to go down, we were going to go down being us. And Mike used to say this all the time, and it's so true, they'll learn to like it. <laughs> and, that, like, and there was a lot of things that we did that were so crazy and unconventional. I mean, the skits that we should not in Mike's face and he uh, you know he cursed on TV like we were always having fun yeah we wanted it to have that vibe like you mentioned this like when your cousins are like kind of hanging out we wanted it to be that way we wanted it to be inviting and we wanted people to be in on our fun the you know sort of the the problem with that is that when sports center we when they asked us to do sports center Mike and I used to joke all the time like have they watched our show like do they know how black we are <laughs> on this, like, all right, you know, they, they say they know, they gonna find out. And so creatively we had a vision for ourselves and um, at least part of my vision uh, in that, in our uh, partnership was that I wanted women to have a home for their opinion. So the name his and hers was very meaningful because it also meant that when I, you know, when I took vacation or when I was off from the show, there had to be a hers. <laughs> okay. Mm, I and love so, that. Yes, there had to be a hers. So that meant that a woman was going to be in a position to drive a show with her opinion. We certainly see women in sports broadcasting, team, be their athletes or experts, and pretty much uh, being the facilitator to everybody else's opinion. In this show, as the woman on the show, it is my opinion that is driving this show, driving the content. And that's a different position to be in, especially if you just see that very often that women are driving the show with their opinion. So considering how often black women are erased from the picture, period, I thought it was even more meaningful and felt 
the responsibility to always not just represent us, but to show us that we deserve to be heard, we deserve to be listened to, and we deserve to be acknowledged and accepted. And um, things that went into the show being successful, but one of the other components that I often talk about is the fact that my male co-host was cheering for me louder than about anybody and was there as a real support for me. And I think that's important that men have to know they can support us without losing something for themselves. This is not a scarcity game, okay? Equality is not about you get some equality, that means I get less. And so Mike also providing a, frankly, a great male role model for men to see that you can be in a situation where a woman is your equal and it's the, it is for the better you are able to do together. Love that. Girl, it's so good. My earring fell off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, you see? You see it, was I I was gonna knowledge, it was the gravity and the knowledge that <laughs> pulled it, it back, you know? I'm going to get it back. <laughs> but you know what? It's so interesting. Like when I, I love so much, I just learned a lot, um, you know, even from what you just said. And one of the things I've always respected so much about you is that you, like, you refuse to, to back down, be silenced, be swayed. And they have tried, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think that's one of the things I respect so much about you, you know, from your podcast to the articles you write, um, you know, and especially on a timeline where, you know, it gets wild <laughs> on Twitter timeline. Um, but what I think I love is that you you kind of stand in your conviction. You you really stand in what and stand up in what you say. Um, and you're always saying how you feel, even when other people don't agree. So I think it's I'm interested to find out from you, how do you feel about why it's important for Black women to kind of find that voice so that they can feel that strong conviction, but also really stay aligned with it and what they believe in as they continue in their careers or continue in their path. Like, how did you find that and then find that that courage, really, to stay aligned? It, it, it took time, but everything okay. kind of starts where, you know, wherever you were raised or how you were raised or I'm from Detroit and Detroit is, is a big the D, that's right. The D. Uh, so cold the in the D. D. It's so cold <laughs> in the D. We will never let it down, no matter what. Never, it's never going to get rid of it. Never going to get rid of it. But the thing about Detroit is that this is a tough city. And by I mean that the people who live there um, in this city are so accustomed to getting the worst of them. I mean, when I was growing up, Detroit was only on television when something awful happened. And usually every year we were on national TV because the murder rate got released and Detroit was usually in the top five. Um, and some years they were number one and it created a perception of who a Detroiter is and for that matter, what Detroiters deserve. So I always grew up with this spirit of wanting to fight. We spend a lot of time as black people, particularly as black women, since we're dealing with double discrimination. We have to do so much sometimes in a daily basis to make other people feel at ease with us. And at some point that gets really exhausting and really tiring. And so there, be, yeah, it came a point where I just decided I really wasn't gonna do that anymore. And that I wasn't going to have to, I wasn't gonna put myself in a position where I felt like I had to minimize me in order uh, for someone else to be greater, for somebody else to be comfortable. Like that, it can't be. So unfortunately, Black women, despite the fact that there is this narrative about how strong we are, and we are strong, and this narrative, yeah, we are very strong. However, there's a certain, um, there is a ceiling that comes with that. People think that we're so strong that we can take everything. And there are things we shouldn't have to take. And they're, they're quick to erase us, quick to make us invisible, but yet want to call on us when things hit the fan. And so it can't be both of those things. Uh, sometimes we have to decide to save ourselves before we start trying to save other people. And so, um, you know, I'm just uh, here to to not just support and love on on Black women in the, in the moment or in many moments, but just um, overall to hopefully that they will understand that uh, it's not about what we can withstand. That's an important part of it. Some The other part of it, too, is about um, it, it's okay for us to be vulnerable. 
It, it really is. And this is the part that I feel like we, um, we get denied. You know, we get denied vulnerability, delicacy, those kinds of things. I mean, that's such a, I remember, you know, one of your last, uh, most recent tweets, you know, talking about that, that women athletes deserve better, you know what I mean? And, and some of the issues that were going on in the locker room with some of the, the NCAA, and then also you tweeting about don't depend on black women to save everybody, you know, when it came to voting in this country, it, it's a lot of times, like you said, it comes to, it's okay if you need us, but we need more than that all the time. So I do feel like it kind of is, and we I know we have a little bit of time left, but just one last quick thought. It, it's kind of slowly becoming the era of the Black woman, right? The, the Renaissance woman, we're slowly starting to get our due. You know, if it's this part right now, where we're at this kind of inflection point where the world is kind of seeing that we're undeniably a force to be reckoned with, what would you say to Black women about how they can really put their voice out there going forward? You know, how can they find success and be heard at this moment that we're in and many of us fought for, many of our ancestors fought for? What's kind of one piece of advice that you would give Black women as we go forward from this time? My advice for Black women is to step into your power. Uh, I think we, um, there, it's, it's sort of a condition to some degree that all women have, but we start to feel guilty about being too successful, being too much, being too whatever it is, because that's about somebody else's idea of who we should be. And so I think now we more than ever need to step into our power and stop apologizing for who we are, because who we are is pretty special. It's unique. Um, it's empowering. It is currency. It's fuel for this nation. Um, there are abilities that we have that we sometimes feel bad about highlighting or bragging about because we're so worried about how they perceive us. And I think what we have seen lately is the unapologetic examples about what happens when you lean into that power. You look at Stacey Abrams, you look at Kamala Harris, um, Latasha Brown with Black Voters Matter, uh, Matter, Tamika Mallory, so many, Angela Rye, so many different women who made the conscious decision that they were going to step into their power and not care about the reactions to it. So I encourage us uh, to do that. You know, I guess maybe the more succinct way to say it rather than me rambling is like, look, tired of being humble, like no more humility. We stepping into this <laughs> and none of Hence why when you started the conversation and you had those wonderful compliments, I said, you know what? I receive it. That's the lesson I'm learning from myself is like, I'm going to receive this love and this praise and not oh, feel embarrassed by it. That's yes. the lesson I have for myself as well. <laughs> I love that. Well, I'm going to take that with me too. This was, this was amazing. This is such a great conversation, Jamel. Thank you so much to all the Black women out there. We love you. Keep leading. Keep leaning into your power. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. woman on the podium, the woman raising her right hand, the woman taking the oath that has previously only been taken by men, the woman being sworn in in Washington, D.C., is an example for every girl growing up today. Thank you for that amazing discussion. We are grateful for you. Now we turn from media voices to the voices of reform. The last year has brought a reckoning on racial justice in America. The deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor brought national attention to the urgency of reforming our criminal justice system. No one understands the issues and opportunities for reform better than the three women we're about to hear from. Deborah Archer is the first black female leader of the American Civil Liberties Union in its 101 year history. She's also a tenured professor of clinical law and the director of civil rights clinic 
at the New York University School of Law. She now speaks with Black Lives Matter co-founder Alicia Garza and New York Attorney General Letitia James. Please join me in welcoming them. Deborah, over to you. Thank you, Donna. I'm incredibly excited to be here with two extraordinary women who are leading the fight to reform our criminal legal system. In July 2013, George Zimmerman was acquitted of murdering Trayvon Martin. The message from that acquittal, repeated by countless juries and prosecutors over the course of American history, is that lives of Black people did not matter. Reacting to the verdict, Alicia Garza posted a message on social media that concluded, Black people, I love you. I love us. Our lives matter. Black Lives Matter, one of the most impactful and important movements in American history, was born from this promise and from this plea. And today she is leading the Black Futures Lab, building and harnessing uh, Black political power. That same year, Tish James was elected public advocate of New York City, the second highest ranking elected official in the city. And just five years later, she was elected attorney general of the state of New York the first black person and first woman to be elected to that position. She has been at the center of some of the most consequential and important legal challenges facing our country. Central to both the Black Lives Matter movement and Attorney General James agendas is the recognition that the criminal legal system has always been and today remains one of the most powerful tools of white supremacy. Today, our criminal legal system operates to control Black people through a system characterized by deep-seated and systemic racism, a failure to recognize the fundamental humanity and dignity of Black people, and the conflation of brown skin with dangerousness and criminality. The result is a system in which Black people are disproportionately killed by the police, stopped by the police, arrested by the police, and more likely to experience physical and emotional harm from their interactions with the police. Black women have always been at the center of the struggle for equal justice to challenge, reform, and reimagine this system. And Alicia Garza and Tish James are an important part of that legacy. So thank you both for joining us for this conversation. Over the past year, it's felt like there's been some significant progress. Uh, in New York, there was a suite of criminal legal system reforms passed um, last year. The US House of Representatives passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and self-described progressive prosecutors are being elected across the country. At the same time, we've seen plenty of examples of things just staying the same and nothing changing. So do you think we are seeing the kind of meaningful change in our criminal legal system that folks have been demanding? And has this been a real reckoning? Um, we have seen some change, but not enough. Um, the George Floyd Policing Act has not been passed by Congress. It was just how passed by one house. and in. New York City, um, they repealed qualified immunity, but there's more that they could have done. Um, and uh, the unfortunately, the mayor of the city of New York has come forward and indicated um, that he will uh, continue to represent the interest of the uh, NYPD, members of NYPD. Um, and the fact is, is that there is two systems. If you have money, there's one set of values, um, especially if you are white. If you are poor, there's another set of values, especially if you are black. And if you suffer from mental illness, um, there is a, another set of values. And it's unfortunate that in our society and in our criminal justice system, um, which is grounded in race and racism, dating back to the slave code, the black code, Jim Crow laws, um, laws that unfortunately were did not apply to people of color um, during lynching, uh, during the civil rights struggle and the civil rights laws that did not uh, were not enforced in other uh, aspects of the New Deal that did not apply to black people um, to stop and frisk to broken windows um, and to uh, now the over policing of communities of color. Um, it has resulted in um, a generation of broken policies uh, that have put more and more black and poor people and individuals suffering from mental illness and substance abuse disorder in jail. And so it is, unfortunately, there are companies and corporations that benefit from our misery and from a criminal justice system that is in badly, in badly in need of reform. Um, and 
this systemic racism that exists not only in our criminal justice system, but you could apply it to other um, aspects of our lives, other institutions, other systems from education um, to uh, parts of social services. Um, it goes to housing. It goes on and on and on. And generations of wealth within the Black community have been lost as a result of this systemic inequalities and these, situ and these policies, which unfortunately do not benefit and do not ignore to the benefit of people of color. And so as we come out of this pandemic, hopefully we can re-engineer our economy and hopefully uh, we can correct some wrongs and ho hopefully we can dismantle a system uh, which, is, uh, which was based on race, which continues to be racist and which continue to, continues to disproportionately affect people of color. I'm so glad you asked this question. And, uh, you know, Tish, you put it so beautifully, really weaving in all of the different ways in which our communities are being left out and left behind by design. And functionally, what that means is that the level of disparities that we see in healthcare, in housing, in the economy, all lead to a particular destination, which is that if you cannot make it, you cannot succeed in those areas, you are more prone and more likely uh, to be caught up in a criminal legal system that frankly was designed uh, to keep our people away from the things that we need to live well. And I also wanna say that knowing all of that, your question about have we gone far enough? Uh, the answer of course is no, but you have to look at it in context. In a criminal legal system that was intentionally designed to keep our communities away from the things that we need, we are seeing the kinds of reforms that allow for that criminal legal system to continue to exist. And it may be tinkering in some ways, right? As you said, uh, you know, around you know, ending qualified immunity, which is a good thing, but of course we know uh, were there the political will and the seriousness about uh, transforming a criminal legal system that functions in this way, uh, then we would go farther in our reforms. And that's, there's no question about that. You know, I also want to highlight that in this last year, one of the things I've seen that has felt the most promising uh, is the BREATHE Act that was introduced from the Movement for Black Lives. It's a way of rethinking, not just how do we uh, divest this disproportionate amount of resources that we pour into a criminal legal system to address problems that it is not equipped to address, and how do we actually redirect those funds to the sectors that our people are being left out and left behind from. You know, when you go to black communities, when you go to communities of color, it's no secret what our communities need. You see that we don't have full service grocery stores. You see that there's a lack of affordable and quality housing. You see that in many of our communities, there's not even access to a hospital where you can receive healthcare, much less access to the healthcare itself. And so redirecting the billions of dollars that we invest in a criminal legal system to contain, surveil, and punish people, right, for not having access to the things that we need to live well is a smart decision. And it frankly goes, it flies in the face of how many of us think about reforms. Oftentimes we think about making police nicer. We think about having them do their jobs better. We think about having them be in more contact and relationship with communities. But I think we forget about the fact that we are asking them to do things that they are not only not trained to do, but they're not equipped to do. Uh, we don't need police officers responding to mental health crises. Uh, we need trained social workers and therapists and medical professionals who understand uh, how to provide that kind of wraparound service. Uh, when we think about police responding to homelessness, right? What are they gonna do about homelessness except put somebody in a cage? They're not equipped to deal with uh, the massive uh, 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 challenges, right, of why people don't have homes and are living in tents under freeways in enormous rates, particularly during this pandemic. So I think to get serious about reforms in a criminal legal system, we have to actually look at the system itself and ask ourselves, what was it designed for? 
Is it functioning uh, to uh, uh, achieve those purposes? And are those purposes the right purposes? Now, I know a lot of people will say things like, well, what happens if there's a crime committed in my community? What happens if there's some kind of harm committed in my community? And I wanna say that for all of the billions of dollars that we invest uh, in policing, uh, we have not seen right um, the kind of uh, 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 results and effects that you would think you would see right from that investment. So why not reinvest those resources into the strategies that we already know work, making sure that people have what they need to live well, to live with dignity, and making sure right, that we are uh, removing military grade weapons from our communities, making sure right, that we are uh, advancing new ways of addressing harm. And then at the same time, uh, transforming the way that we think about what a criminal legal system could even possibly do and making sure that we're making the right kinds of investments that actually address the problems that we're trying to address. And, and can I say this? You know, Alicia touched on an um, Alicia I touched on a really important issue. There's these structural incentives to local governments and to law enforcement agencies, and the choice that they have is continuing to perpetuate the cycle of misery or losing federal dollars. There's something wrong with that equation when that is when those are your two options. And so the thought of losing federal dollars because we want to reinvest in human services, um, in social services, and in the development of individuals, you know, is a is a Hobson's choice. And so we have got to uh, again uh, recreate, re-energize, recommit, um, and re-engineer our system because the reality is is even if we were to strike down every unjust law, um, every bigoted policies. So many lives have been destroyed, grinded up in a criminal justice system, and we can never, ever atone for the damage that has been done to generations of individuals who are still struggling under the weight of policy as a result of racist and bigoted policies born um, out of um, racial animus. But how do, we, how do we get there? I think you both have said powerfully that we're not anywhere near where we need to be. So what do we do to continue to not only advance a conversation, but actually action around uh, mass criminalization, mass incarceration, racialized police violence, police accountability? How do we move the conversation and then action about criminal legal system reform and police violence from one that's shaped by uh, bad apples to one that seeks to challenge the systemic racism that you've talked about that's really deeply embedded within um, our criminal legal system and all of our systems, economic, educational, housing, that continues to get um, more and more deeply embedded with every passing day. And how do we move to having action that supports the health, safety, and power of black communities and make sure that our budgets reflect our, our, our values? So first of all, we need core principles. And I think, you know, Ms. Garza at the outset of this, her, of the movement, Black Lives Matter movement said it best. Um, we should really be about um, respecting the lives of all individuals and that all lives, but, but particularly black lives because they're right now uh, under such extreme threat that they matter. We need, to, I, we need to all come together and focus on identifying core principles. Um, and, you know, I think you need political will. You, individual, elected officials need steel in their backbone um, and they've got to divest, reinvest, whatever term you want to use. But we need more, you know, clean energy, clean water. Um, we need uh, uh, clean air. We need housing, critical housing. We need jobs. We need training. We need access to education. We need child care. We need transportation. All of that and more should be um, the focus of the Biden-Harris administration and every municipality. And we should incentivize governments to do just that, as opposed to the reverse perversion to incentivize, again, investing in misery or losing federal dollars. If we could just um, focus on, you know, uh, focus on, again, reinventing policing as we know it and recognizing that one, 
uh, you know, qualified immunities. There's been everybody's been really critical of the New York City Council in the aftermath of um, uh, you know, their efforts. And then in runs other elected officials who say, oh, don't worry, we're going to continue to indemnify you. It's just going to continue. The practice will continue. We need to change use of force policies. We need to chain out, change our grand jury policies. We need to stop this over-policing of communities of color. We need to decriminalize marijuana. I'm glad the state legislature and the governor have finally agreed upon decriminalizing marijuana in New York state, but we need to go further. There are some relatively minor crimes that should be not be enforced by the police, such as the, the, the uh, offense that Eric Gardner was uh, charged with, selling Lucy's on a damn corner. There should not have been a police response to that. Or Daniel Prude, the case that my office prosecuted, an individual who was in the throes of mental illness, his family crying out for a mental health professional. And what did they say? send? They sent in police. And what happened? It was a death sentence. Um, so all of that and more, but it basically comes down to what um, Ms. Garza said at the outset during the, the beginning of this movement. And that is, um, it, we should come from a place of love and respect for the lives of all of God's people, but particularly black people, since they've been under so much threat and pressure and misery. Mm -hmm. You know, I would just add to that, uh, that we need to get serious about getting organized. You know, I get this question all the time about, well, what can we actually do? And there are so many things that we can do. Tish, you put out a whole bunch of things that are immediately actionable. Uh, my organization, the Black to the Future Action Fund, put out a Build Back Boulder mandate for the Biden-Harris administration, a literal legislative roadmap for how we even set the floor for what these kinds of reforms must look like. Uh, everything from responding to relief and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic of which black communities uh, are, are being attacked by, frankly, the, the effects, the devastating effects of this disease. And now, of course, uh, through the racial inequity of the distribution of the vaccine, as well as a lack of information about the vaccine itself in our communities. Even if we start there, right, we are putting people in a better position to be able to be resilient in the face of the multiple crises that Black communities are, are struggling with every single day. I also want to say with this question of political will, so much of this has to do with how much and how strongly our communities are organized. You know, every four years, every two years, we get up in arms about a changing of the guard. And then once we've changed the guard, we forget about what it takes to build political will. Politics is not a snack machine. You don't put in your quarter, press B6 and get your candy bar. You have to stay on the people who you elect to represent you. And as Tish said, you have to also set their agenda. And when they stray from that agenda, you have to make sure uh, that those people understand that there are consequences when they disappoint us. And, and Deborah, you know, one last thing that we, we rarely talk about, you know, as I look at other states, particularly in the South, what I am talking to people on the ground, one grassroots organizing is key. And I want to thank Alicia Garza for organizing individuals on the ground. But as you look at other states, and you look at their criminal just, justice system, what I have uncovered is that individuals um, who are on probation, parole, or are on um, house arrest have to pay for those services, which further deepens and um, their, which, which, which continues to grind them in poverty. And if they fail to make a payment, they're rearrested. They were already poor to begin with. And then this just makes it even worse. It compounds the poverty. And so I find those offenses or that, that uh, those policies particularly offensive because they keep people in poverty. Absolutely. Thank you both for sharing your wisdom and your time. Thank you. Thank you.
Hey, everybody, it's Goddess. You thought we were going to stop the conversation? No, no, no. The conversation for the Black Women Lead event will continue over on Twitter in our new audio feature called Twitter Spaces. Just follow me at, at Goddess Rivera and jump into the audio conversation where we will have some special guests. So come on, I'll see you over there. Don't you know who this is? She was thinking of something more special. I'm downright flashy, you know. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Billy Holiday. Reporters keep asking me, Billy, why you do the things you do? This is what I tell them. I love me. We love you. When I take on. The NAACP says Billy Holiday is the voice of our people. I think we should integrate the audience for this show. Let's change it up a little bit. You know, blacks and whites sitting together. You know what you're getting yourself into when you decide to come on the road. Get out my goddamn clothes. I'm gonna take everything except your bra and your man. <laughs> Which one of my songs is your favorite song? Strange Fruit. Yeah, it's a song about important things, you know. Things that are going on in the country. This holiday woman's causing a lot of people to think the wrong things. It's a starting gun for this so-called civil rights movement. Those lyrics provoke people. Y'all got a plan? She's a drug addict. Exactly. I cut strange fruit. I want to sing the damn song. It's for your own good, okay? I sing what the fuck I want. Silent trees. Get her off that stage. They're strange fruit. They won't let me sing nowhere. No clubs, no money, no nothing. You gotta understand, baby. Right now, I'm in a situation. Would you say we could beat this, Billy? I need some now. Blood on the leaves. You're like a hammer. Come right back and it hit harder than before. And blood. He's singing it for all of us. <laughs> Ain't no other Negro star bold enough to do it. Black body swinging. I'm being followed. I'm not gonna count in no fizz. In the southern breeze. She's made something of herself, and you can't take it because she's strong, beautiful, and black. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. You think I'm gonna stop singing that song? You grandkids will be singing Strange Fruit. Now, it is my honor and privilege to speak with singer, songwriter, and actress, Andra Day, winner of the Golden Globe for her performance in the United States versus Billie Holiday, and now an Oscar nominee. Andra, sister, welcome. <laughs> Thank you welcome. so much, sis. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to be here and to be speaking with you. Your force is just so powerful. Thank you for having me. Well, the honor is all of ours. I, I am so happy to be with you. Congratulations on all of your success on the Golden Globe win and your Oscar nomination. You are incredible. In fact, spellbinding in this role, and you deserve all of the many accolades that you are receiving. Now, I have a question. We've been talking tonight about the power of Black women's voices to make change. The movie is about the life and iconic voice of Billie Holiday, but it also recounts the horrific ways that she was persecuted by the FBI throughout her life. They feared her voice, and music would inspire people to protest for civil rights. It feels incredibly relevant and current somehow that so many people tried to silence her. How did Billie Holiday's voice make change? You know, I think Billie Holiday's voice uh, made change because she was trying to, attempting to, and in a lot of ways successfully just simply being, she was living her life as a black queer woman in the 30s, 40s and 50s. And she was trying to do that freely, you know? And, and I think 
that alone, that, that sort of challenges this system of white supremacy of racial inequity. And I think oftentimes we don't realize as women, as black women, that just us simply being and us simply standing in our strength and our power and our freedom, uh, that is such a challenge to, to a system that wants to continue to oppress, you know? And, and so I think with Billie Holiday, I, 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 I people have asked me, you know, do, do you think that she thought she was an activist or she was, and I don't think she was, I think she was just, you know, like I said, a, a free black woman who saw that lynching was wrong. You know, it was, she was using her platform, her music, her voice to sing a song about racial terror in America about lynching, you know, and, and she was holding a mirror up to the nation. And so her voice and her song and the way she presented herself represented truth in a system of racial inequality that is built off of lies and deception. And so, you know, she voiced her and voices like hers really threatened to dismantle that system. And that is why they went and created this war on drugs and went after her so heavily so that they could stop her from singing this song and from integrating audiences. You know, it was a huge feat for her to integrate Carnegie Hall at the time she did. She was one of the very first artists to do that. So she, she threatens a system of racial inequality. You know, I'm sure when Lee Daniels came to you and said, Andrew, I, I want you to play this part. Why was it important for you to do this part? Did you hope to inspire social change through the role? Well, interestingly enough, when the idea first came to me, I actually did the opposite. I ran from it and said, I know. <laughs> you ran from this role? Oh my God. Literally you ran from the role. It. I, and listen, and I will tell you, not because I didn't want the story told, not because I didn't love Billie Holiday. And actually discovering that it was going to tell the true story of her life incentivized me to, to do the audition. But I, I'm not an actress, you know, or I shouldn't say I'm not, I guess. Lee and my, my co-stars are always like, you're an actor. So I, I'm not, I, I was not an actor before this, you know, and so that was the big thing for me was like, I don't want to be terrible. Also, I love Billie Holiday. And the last thing I want to do is be that one person that tried to step into her shoes and just like stained her legacy, you know, because right. Diana was so brilliant in Lady Sings the Blues. I mean, that's iconic for us, you know. And so I thought she was brilliant. Audrey McDonald was amazing on Broadway at Lady Day at Emerson Bar and Grill. And so I just thought that everybody would say they were amazing. And you remember that one time Andrew Day tried to be Billie Holiday, like that kept <laughs> running through my head, you know? So I said, wait, you know, this is, I don't know about this, but I, I wanted to meet Lee because I thought he's such a great filmmaker. I'm a big fan of his, he's really passionate. And I think he represents us well, regardless of, you know, the, the, the flack that people give him for it. I, I think that he represents us truthfully. So I said, okay, I'm going to meet with him. And, you know, I, I found out from that meeting that it would not be a retelling of Lady Sings the Blues, because though I loved the movie, I was aware as a fan of Billy's that it wasn't the full picture of how the government went after her. It was just what we were really allowed to say at the time, because the Anslinger, Harry J. Anslinger and Jed Hoover were still alive and in power. Um, so, uh, but I found out from Lee that they would be talking about the war on drugs, how she was singing Strange Fruit in defiance of the government, integrating audience, how she was a hero and truly one of the early godmothers of civil rights. And so that incentivized me to do the audition. And then for me, I, I consider myself a, a deeply spiritual person. So it was a prayer and a scripture about, <laughs> I was actually praying for it to go away. <laughs> <laughs> but upon the, upon the reading, it was to not pray the storm away, but instead to be caused to do an act of great faith. And that's when I knew, okay, I have to trust Lee and I have to jump in. And, and, and I think the motivating factor was my, was my spirituality was Lee and vindicating Billie Holiday's legacy. That drove all of us when we were on set, you know. You know, I, I got to ask this question because the film starts with this simple statement about the 1937 anti-lynching bill and the fact that the United States Senate failed to pass the bill, it mm -hmm. ended. It ended with a similar statement that in 2020, the United States Senate continued yes. to help progress on this important issue. What do you think it will take for us to finally get into the consciousness of the American people that lynching is morally wrong? You said it in a film, I thought, you were so eloquent, but you said, this is, this is inhumane, it's immoral. You, yeah. I mean, what will it take? I, I think, for, I think first, first, I think truth again, you know, it, it comes down to that. It, 
telling stories like Billie Holiday's, telling the truth about, you know, lynching and the anti-lynching bill. I think America has, America does, and I'm not going to really parse words here because I just, my daddy's from Detroit and I'm not good at that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, go ahead. You know, Yes. Yeah, so, you know, it, it, it also has to do, America does a good job of changing her history, of sugarcoating things, of totally getting rid of narratives. And one of the things they were able to successfully do is boil lynching down to a hanging that, that some fringe um, rogue KKK group, you know, uh, orchestrates, but lynching was the culture in America. You know, it's why I don't do picnics now, right? Because the modern definition as we know it in America was used to celebrate a lynching. You, you, you find somebody, you lynch them, you burn their house, and then you set out your blankets and celebrate with your kids and all. You know, so it's, it's really understanding the definition of lynching, which is not hanging by a rope, you know, but it is a mob killing of Black people, particularly by the police, by the city council people, by judges, by jailers, by city officials, you know. So this was these are these people. They're not a fringe group. They're not. A, that was the culture in America. And so I think it's really, really understanding that, yes, at the center of lynching is race. This idea that it's like, well, murder is illegal and it falls under that. It doesn't because murder was still illegal when lynching is legal, is legal technically, you know, which is why, again, I think if we had this anti-lynching bill, we might that might retrain the police to operate differently. We might see them operate differently when you actually have to adhere to, to these laws, you know? And so, you know, it's more than just immoral, you know, the legality of it is also brought into question. So, and I think continuing to tell stories and to tell the truth about lynching, about racial terror in America, the places that it took place. We cannot just relegate it to a fringe group in the South anymore. It was all over the country. I think the North gets, gets off very easy when it comes to these things, but it was happening all along the North as well. You know, it's sort of what led up to Tulsa, you know? And so I think to really tell the truth about these things and have a real understanding of what lynching is, a real understanding of, of, of our stories, of, of the true narrative of, of racial terror in America, I think. And it's a truth that's not been very welcome for, for a long time, you know? So powerfully said. All the work you are best known for conveys powerful messages of hope and resistance. What has inspired you to inspire others through art? Um, you know, it's so funny too, because I don't know that I'm so intentionally like, like even when it came to writing Rise Up, I wasn't, I, that day I was not even looking to make a song period, <laughs> let alone like, let me make something that's really motivating. I, I, I actually really didn't want to go in the studio. I was tired and was feeling for the first time like my career was not gonna go or happened the way I had imagined and I had no plan B. A friend had just been diagnosed with cancer. So it was really, I, I will tell you, I think at the core of it for me is my faith. It is really, I, I, I have encountered God and I say Christ in very powerful, powerful, loving, beautiful ways in my life, in ways that make me sad when I, <clears throat> I, I again, not parsing words. I, I think that the people with sort of the biggest agenda and a lot of hate in their hearts seem to have the loudest um, microphone right now, which makes me really, right. really like it. And so my faith really drives me to do that because for me, I understand uh, through that perspective myself to be a servant. So not just a servant to God, but a servant to you, a servant to every person I encounter and to those I have not met yet, you know? And so I always think about this scripture, regard one another as higher than yourselves. And I imagine this mm -hmm. world where everybody does that and how beautiful that looks. You know, I think we're so worried that we'll lose out or things will be taken or things will you know, but the reality is even if things have been taken from me, you know, or I've never, I, I go look where we're at. And this isn't, ju this is just to use this as an example, but, but um, yeah, I, I think it's because I, I, through that perspective, view myself as a servant. And so, yeah, e even with my platform and with these resources, though it's a blessing and I celebrate them all, I also recognize them as tools to help encourage people, you know, and so uh, that that's my goal, you know, um, even if it's just a fun party song, you know what I mean? I think it can yeah. still have people in a, in, a, in a good way. Well, I think that spirituality comes through, not just in your music, but your, all of your appearances. I'm, I'm a big fan and you've enabled so many women to rise, to see themselves as something bigger than just what society has framed us as. So I want you to know that as a, an activist, we look up to you because 
at a time when we needed a voice, we needed a song, an anthem for the moment, your music came alive in our hearts and it lifted our spirits. So thank you for all, for not giving up. Let's just say, thank you for going into that studio. Thank you for opening up your mouth and letting that joy come from wherever, because I know it was in your soul and it just came out because we still feel it when we hear your voice. Now, I know it's been 20 years since the last black woman, Halle Berry won the Oscar for best actress. Yeah. There have been five Black women nominated since, including your fellow nominee, Viola Davis. What does it mean to be nominated? And what will it mean if, I'm going to just go ahead and claim it, when you win? <laughs> I love you. Thank you so much. Um, no, it, it's, it is such an honor. But I mean, especially, this is a category of just brilliant women. W w women are brilliant. You know what I mean? That's just... That's what we do, but to be nominated, particularly with Viola Davis, you know, she's definitely one of my inspirations, not just creatively, not just, she was one. There was a handful of actors really that I studied, you know, that I loved and their actors and performances that I thought were amazing. And she was one. So it's unbelievable to be nominated with her. It's also unreal. I, I cannot express to people how much beautiful black girl love I have received from this woman, you know, like, yes. and, 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 and that just to see that support, because I think, you know, to see that or to feel that just really, you know, people have constantly been like, oh, how does it feel to compete against? And I'm like, we're not competing. You know, we're just representing different people in different worlds in this category. And I just refuse to hold on to that idea that we're competing because we've been for far, far too long convinced that that is what we're doing. And you see it, you see it across social media. You see, I refuse to say negative things about other women ever. And it's because I think we've been so conditioned to believe we are competing. And it right. feels this idea that there is limited space in these places for us. And it's just not true, you know? And so it's just, it's a huge, huge honor. And to know that Halle Berry was the last person is, is beautiful. But at the same time I go, well, it doesn't fully really reflect the work because in 20 years, black women have done sensational work. You know what I mean? And so, Absolutely. and, and I, I would say that I don't know that the category has fully been littered with other women of color, you know what I mean? And so I, you know, it wasn't sort of like we've been, so many other women of color have been represented in there. So I, I think it doesn't fully reflect the work. And, and that goes to the, this, the point of representation, you know, it's this idea that, we, we have for too long sort of seen ourselves through the lens most often, um, and again, not parsing words, through white, straight, male, Christian patriarchy, you know what I mean? And that is sort of, we see ourselves through that lens. We see all of these categories in these movies through that lens. And so we can't actually truly get an accurate depiction of art, of life, of culture, of history, um, when we only have that, those, those goggles sort of to look through. So I think it's, it just reminds me that it's imperative uh, that we have more voices that represent us and look like us so we can say, no, this is important. This is relevant. This is well done. This is quality. You know, this is just different, you know, from what you're used to. So I think that um, it's an honor, but it does remind me that we have a ways to go, you know. Absolutely. You know, I have to ask this question because um, I'm a fan of what I, I love, costumes, makeup, the whole, <laughs> all of the backstories of making movies and being on television. Girl, you wore them dresses. Hey. I, mean, I just have to say that. You wore them dresses, okay? Thank I don't you. know who outfitted you. I, I read somewhere that you lost a substantial amount of weight, but yes. you wore them dresses, girl. You <laughs> I love that. And first of all, I know that you love fashion because I'd be seeing you out here and I'm like, okay, clock that. <laughs> Inspired by that, the necklace, the hair, everything. So no, it yeah. was you know, Prada Def. They did a lot of the dresses for the movie. They weren't able to do all of them just for timing reasons, but you know, Prada just loved the story and got involved. And the costume designer, Paolo Nieru, I have to give him so, so, so much credit because he... When I tell you, I mean, not one string, not one strand, not one, nothing would be ill-fitting, not under his watch. And there's, you don't meet people that often that work that hard to the point where, and I, he'll probably kill me for sharing this story about him. 
But at one point, <laughs> one set, we didn't use one of the robes that he had planned and he just put all of this time and work and effort. And the poor baby, when I tell you, he actually cried, like actually had to take a minute and go ball over. That's how emotionally he connected was with Billy, with Lee, with myself, with these costumes, with Prada. You know, so I, I just, I have to say like, I if listen, and also I'm just gonna confess. Yep, yeah, I stole some stuff from set, and I have no shame about it. I don't care. <laughs> well, if I have to go out and lose a, a guilt, gazillion pounds, <laughs> I would take one of them dresses. It was I worth mean, it too. It was worth it, and I hate being and the home. robes and yeah, the oh. robes. I mean, it was it was everything was impeccable. Thank Andrew, you. thank you so much for your time. It is a joy to be with you, and I want to just say on behalf of so many women and girls. You are an inspiration, your work and your commitment to art for change. We will be rooting for you on Oscar night. Girlfriend, I'm gonna have my bottle of champagne. I wanna see your right outfit. Next. I wanna okay. see your outfit on Oscar night. <laughs> you know I'm gonna be tuned in. I'm gonna be tuning in and rooting for you. I must as I'm gonna say a little prayer for you. Yes, thank you so, so, so much. And I, I'll receive all of them. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, thank you. And God bless you and continue to soar, my, my dear sister. Continue to soar and continue to lift up others as you climb because you've done so much for so many people. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of so many of us for thank giving you. us our inspiration and our anthem. Uh, thank you so much, Donna. And I feel the same about you. I'm not just saying this because we're in this call. So thank you so much. It takes a village. You, you are definitely leading that. So thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you, my friend. God bless you. Yes, God bless you too. It has been my pleasure to host this amazing program. Now it is time for me to turn it back over to All In Together CEO, Lauren Lita, to close our program. Lauren? Thank you, Donna and Andra. And thank you to all of tonight's speakers, presenters, and sponsors. It has never been a more important time to amplify the voices of Black women, and we are grateful for all of you. All In Together is committed to supporting women to become leaders in their communities. Our programs around the country ensure the voices of Black women and women from every background and perspective are heard and reflected in politics and American life. If you're interested in taking a greater leadership role in your community, or just want to learn more, please go to aitogether.org and sign up and be sure to follow us on social media. We're continuing the program now at Twitter Spaces with Goddess Rivera to keep this great conversation going. Thank you all for being with us. Good night. <laughs>